Yay, there are. Hello. 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 Hey, how are you guys doing? Hey. 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 So great. I like the bag. Very Hermes orange. Thank you. <laughs> so cheers, you guys. Look, I'm equipped. <laughs> this will end well. The sun is over the yard arm here, at least. So. So welcome, everyone. So now we'll Thank you so much for being on a fabulous Writers in Conversation panel. Um, Diane, I realize you can't see me, but hi. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, so this was something that we all really wanted to do, is get all of our fabulous writers from different uh, forums, different disciplines, all together, all. Different consciousness. Different consciousness. Are you sure? Because you guys look like you're melding over there. <laughs> I, I wouldn't fight it at this point. No. I mean, she's already wrapped you in cobras. So, yeah. <laughs> so many cobras. <laughs> we might be building trebuchets as a group activity at some point. You know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I. Here advises me that the plans for the trebuchet come from a company called the Gray Company, who were um, an Australia based crowd of reenactors and they do the famous trebuchet cheese chucker. Well, if it comes from Australia, it must be safe. <laughs> <laughs> this thing this thing is designed to throw baby bell cheeses. Um, I believe, you know ten ten to twelve meters. Yeah, I mean, you know, every now and then you've got to meet somebody who you really want to hit right here with a small cheese. Every now and then I just meet somebody I want to put into a trebuchet. You <laughs> would argue the point. <laughs> yeah. We built God knows. Fred X. I would like to be fed by a trebuchet. <laughs> no. no, 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 you wouldn't. No? No. Well, I mean, not as long as there's not cobras in the trebuchet. <laughs> If I hit you in the face with a cobra, you'd be cool with it. I would. <laughs> I would. Is, has this been getting kinky before I arrived? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell kind of sex oh, God. do you play? <laughs> you, Let's you not get into the cheese, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> I hope all of you learned this a lot about man was accusing me of being seriously <laughs> I, I heard the word when she gets filthy she gets seriously filthy you know god forbid I should put, do anything to put people off that concept <laughs> I did say that yesterday yes you did I should. or you should have um do, do we have even a remote rubric at all? For like, is there, this, or are you just there winging is, it? There is, as far as I know, no rubric. Oh, great. Uh, so if you want to talk about writing, if you want to talk about cobras, if you want to talk about, I don't know, your, your interesting cobra sex games, like... <laughs> is, is there... Is there some new definition of cobra I should be apprised oh, of? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Snake fandom. Why the hell not? How about how about this? What if we have the audience direct it with no cobra talk at all for at least another hour? Um, and you can ask a question that the three of us will discuss. Oh, there we go, right in the back. Um, and I'll repeat the question for you, Diane. Mostly I can get them, it's okay. He outlines like very thoroughly. Yes. 60 pages. What about, like, what goes into Cecini's 60 pages? What goes into, like, any outlining you other two do? Did you hear that? That one you could repeat for me because we okay. were breaking up a little. So they were referencing how you uh, 
was it furiously outlined? Sixty Maybe page us. outlines. You do, yeah. So Honor. you're asking specific. This is how TV writers do it. This, uh, yeah, I uh, I had mentioned this yesterday when I did the reading for my book, but I am also a gratuitous outliner as well. Uh, each of my book, that was not filthy. Don't laugh at that. that was, <laughs> totally, totally mature. Um, I am also I have to master plan everything. I can't. Um, I even master plan reviews, and most of the time, none of you ever get to see the actual outline. Um, every once in a while, you'll get to see one of my reviews that's the bullet points, and that's when every once in a while I'm just like, I don't have time. This is what my thought process was. But I usually turn that into the review that you then see, because I figure out what are the things I want to talk about, or I have the ability to talk about, because sometimes I have a point and I'm like, no, I don't actually know what I'm saying, so I just discard it. Um, but in terms of um, writing, I used... Uh, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the snowflake method um, for writing. Uh, it doesn't work for everyone. I doubt I'm going to use it again, but it worked really good because I'd never finished a novel. So I was like, here is a very well-defined way to write a novel. Um, and I used that for my first one and ended up writing a, probably about 50 to 6 page, 50 to 60 page uh, outline synopsis um, uh, for the entire book. I heard you do not do that, Shana. Um, the outline for the book I just finished was, I want an excuse to go to Disney World. Yeah. Touche. That's pretty good. I'm pretty sure I know which character. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of agreement. There's a lot of agreement for that school of thought. Uh, Steve Perry, when he was doing licensed work, used to refer to his books as Conan the Hot Tub, Conan the New Roof, <laughs> Conan the New Patio Deck. And that, those were his outlines. And he would just spin this stuff out of his head. Um, continue, because, you know. Oh, he froze all this afternoon. Ah, we froze. Okay, there you go. You're fine. Well, I don't, spiritually, no, I don't know. No, she's frozen again. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. No, no. So then I'm, okay. I'm. Oh, there you go. I just, I just had, I just had 30 seconds of freeze frame there. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to work past that. My difficulty is that I have been Pavlovianly conditioned as an animation writer from the very early time. Around the time I was writing my first few novels, I was also writing a script, a 10-minute or 20-minute script, as it might be for. Captain Caveman or uh, Scooby-Doo, Scrappy. Scrappy and I are, are coterminaries. It, it, it's strange, but true. And the one thing you learn about work at that stage in time is that nothing, there is no money without an outline. All right. So you write uh, step deals remain endemic in Hollywood. So you write a premise, you get money. You write a longer, you know, treatment. You get money. You write an outline. You get more money. And so you are being conditioned in a very straightforward way. You want to eat? You write an outline. <laughs> That's all there is to it. And since I was also writing novels at the same time, uh, and in fact, so you want to be a wizard would not have happened without Scooby Doo. Uh, <laughs> there's something to think about. That's something to think about. Um, as a result, I became a very serious outliner. And uh, Scrivener has proven a godsend in this regard. Used to be I had to have all kinds of fancy outlining software to help me. Not anymore. Scrivener handles that and handles that you can nest bits of outline 12 deep. I have yet to find a depth to which Scrivener will not plunge in this regard, which is good. Uh, and it just helps you get the job done. You, you can manage micro bits of plot and shuffle them like a deck of cards, drag them and drop them where you want them, and suddenly the universe makes sense until you, you know, actually realize that that one particular piece of plot was in fact crap. It will never fly. And then you have to rip it all up and do it again. Uh, I should stop. What have you got? So I had a question for you, Sean. Is th is, has there ever been either a short story novella, novel, whatever, where you found you needed to do more preparation than you were used to? Well, I spent two years talking to the CDC so I could write these. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there, there's never been a book. Since I figured out how to write books, mm -hmm. as in I can put 150,000 words in a line, 
I can do that without much preparation. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily good when I'm done. That's what editing and revision yeah, is yeah. for. But the putting of the words in a line it does not get easier or harder based on my outlining. Um, the amount of research. You just do that. Huh? You just do that. You sit your bet your yourself in the chair and you do that yeah. every day until suddenly you have 150,000 words. Yeah. It, it works. It's not until later that the question arrives, are these the right words? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes. Okay, another question. Someone. Way over here. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> How do you guys, like, get over writer's block or really help yourself focus when you're trying to write? How do you get over writer's block or help yourself focus when you write? Um, I do something else. Uh, I, you know, and here's the thing is, is it's interesting because even though I rely on the outline, I wonder if I'm already starting work on my second book and I'm noticing I'm doing less outlining work mm -hmm. than usual because now I finished one and I've gone through a couple right. rounds of like pure editing and I'm like, oh, this is what this feels like. Um, but actually sitting down to write, I write between five to 10,000 words of sitting every single time. Um, so my first book, if you actually time the amount of time it took, I took between 20 and 30 days to write a book. Because I just it just happens. I'm so used to every day sitting down and writing, you know, anywhere from mm -hmm. four to six reviews. That the you're right, putting one word after the other. I don't necessarily have to think about that. Um, and so for writer's block, if that ever happens, uh, as soon as I recognize like I'm am stuck, I go write something else, or I leave the house for ten minutes. The it's the sitting there is what I was taught as a kid in high school and in junior high. You just sit there and you figure out the problem. No, 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 that's not going to work. You, writer's block is going to get worse and worse and worse when you're sitting there obsessing over how do I get this person from point A to point B? How do I get this conversation to turn in the way that I want to? Um, and oftentimes stepping away, one of two things happens for me. I figure it out. I know how to right. do it. Or I realize that point B doesn't actually make sense and I'm trying to force this in an unnatural way. So uh, leave. Leave it. Yeah. Even if it's just for 10 minutes or an hour, do something else. I mean, half the time writer's block is that your brain has not yet finished baking. And especially if you're moving at five to 10,000 words a day or, or Stephen King tries to do five pages a day or whatever <laughs> your comfortable daily benchmark is, if you finish cleaning out the buffer your brain has built, so you've, you've run out of road, then your brain is going to be like, I like bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a rainbow in a locket. <laughs> that is the solution to all problems. And that is where you switch to another project or you do so. I watch a lot of Law and Order, <laughs> a lot of Law and Order, because it is essentially formulaic and mindless. Um, it's also why I rewatch TV. You know, because watching TV, you have to think about it. Rewatching TV, you just kind of relax and enjoy yeah. it. Um, and that helps. Yeah. We're looking at you. I had I had a I had a writer's block once. It was called menopause. <laughs> and as writers' lifespans and women's writers' lifespans get longer, we're going to have to start talking about this shit because it's real. Uh, a while before Terry Pratchett got so bad that he couldn't leave the house anymore. He and I sat down, we were in a bar, who knows what bar, and at, at a Discworld convention, who knows what Discworld convention. And we're just chatting about the ways our brains are betraying us. And he said, you know, I sit down and I can't remember the page I just wrote. And I said, brother, I hear you. Anybody tells you that, that short-term men memory loss in menopause is anecdotal, I got your anecdote right here. And for the guts of five years, I could not write a page until I had scrolled the document down to read what I had just written. And I can't tell you how scary that is. And if the last couple of Young Wizards books were a bit late, that would be why. Now, thank God it burned itself out. Everything, you know, I'm back in the saddle now and, and I have a lot of work to catch up on. I mean, the goal each year I live, I ought to have as many books in print as I've been alive. And I've, I fell behind. I fell behind the last 10 years. It's time to get busy. You know, it's not an ambitious goal. It's not an ambitious goal. Listen, um, there are writers who, in terms of how prolific they were, and this without dragon naturally speaking or any of the tools we use now make us look all of us kind of like weak sauce 
Um, there is one uh, mystery writer in particular, Edgar Thing. He was in the 19, early 1900s. Oh? Um, no, 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 no. This was, would have been after Poe. This chap's name always eludes me. I'm assuming it's Envy. All right, on my part. Peter would tell me in a second who, who it is. But anyway, this guy was so prolific that there were cartoons about him in Punch where a news agent is leaning over the desk uh, or you know, leaning over the, the, the news agent's you know, spread of magazines and so forth and say, what, Edgar Wallace, thank God, and saying to a passerby, sir, have you seen the noontime Wallace? <laughs> so I, went to his grave having written 400, 500 books. He was beyond the J.K. Rowling of his time in terms of wealth mm -hmm. just because of how prolific he was. He, he absolutely had uh, an assistant to whom he dictated. But to, to this guy, you know, 60,000 words in two days was no big deal. He had several secretaries. He could go through them. I'm and... It, he, <laughs> Are you? I am. I'm six books behind. Oh, my God. <laughs> You'll catch up. I, you know, I have a problem with that because, you know, I have other things to be doing, theoretically, and, you know, I will catch up because I, I'm getting now what I think amounts to my third win. Mm -hmm. But, uh, please. Are you going to do the Omnitopia sequel now? <laughs> <laughs> So, Shad, stop beating your wife. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, this is not something I can sort of discuss now. Okay. You bad girl. <laughs> you said that you had trouble writing for a couple of years. I thought that might be why it got delayed. Um, I can't discuss that right now. Okay. <laughs> other, other things, absolutely got stuck um and thank god they're not stuck anymore yeah um thank you <laughs> <laughs> right, who's next yes um, I was just please curious, uh how much each of you talk to friends or other writers about what it is that you're writing and how much that helps or hinders your process hmm. <laughs> did you hear that <laughs> I did. Okay. Um, here's the problem. Since I live with a writer and one who is congenitally nosy about what I'm doing, <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, half of it is, well, he's my husband. What the hell am I supposed to do about that? It says here, um, you know, with all my worldly stuff I be endow, and I, I'm not sure that absolutely includes all aspects of, inter, of intellectual property. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are questions you can't answer, and, and you learn quickly when you're half of a creative partnership not to ask. Um, other writers are another story. Um, so you can either fob them off with, um, you know, casual humor and knocking off your own camera or you can move on to you know to other things like none of your damn business it, 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 it the trouble is that your your fellow writers can really help you sometimes and the challenge is always trying to figure out when the part of your brain that underlies the the uh, strictly structural business of the writer's brain wants to cooperate or not because we all have junk going on in the hind brain that does not necessarily uh, mesh correctly 
with the strictly structural and, and you know, business-like parts of, of the job. Sometimes your, your brain does not want to tell you why something is not working, and it certainly doesn't want to tell that other writer over there. Uh, because asking for advice might be seen as a sign of weakness. Because God forbid we should ever admit that we have no idea what the hell we're doing. <laughs> and most of the time, to let the truth be told, this thing here is a black box. Most of the time, we have no idea what's going on in there. And, and I have to say, you know, I'm a psychiatric nurse, or was in the day. I ought to know what's going on in here. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> You know? Do you? I, I mean, I I wait till I have something written. I would rather have, like, any of the the few conversations that I've had about here's a scene I'm writing, here's a thing that's done that I wanted someone to look over. I don't, I don't really ask people, like, while I'm writing it, like, hey, what do you think about trying to do this or whatnot? Because I'd much rather have something specific so that they can react to it. If I'm writing a scene I'm like, and I am experimenting with tense or I'm experimenting with a different point of view. I want the specific feedback. So the few mm -hmm. times I have talked to people, it's like, can you read this passage sort of thing if something's bothering me. However, I'm like you, where I just wanted to get it done and then have people yell at me. You know, like I wanted to have the full manuscript done. When I was done that first draft, I knew there were at least 100 problems in it. And I knew that it wasn't perfect and it needed a lot of work, but I wanted to hear it from someone else. Um, and ha doing what I do online and having people react and give feedback immediately brought down my ego real quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, and so my first round of editing, as brutal as it was, it wasn't that bad. I was like, I had like a 60 seconds of, I'm the worst writer of all time. And then I was like, eh, who cares? Yeah. And, got, and got over it. So not, not really, I find that I talk to writer friends more about business stuff mm -hmm. than the actual text and the manuscript. I want to know more yeah. stuff about agents and publishing. That's the stuff where I have way more conversations. Yes. I have editor friends that I talk to about the writing stuff because <clears throat> my writer friends, you know, there's there's that whole thing of reciprocity. You don't want to be the one that's just, enough about you, let's talk about yeah. me. How do you <laughs> feel about me? Um, so you don't want to do that, but if I'm working on a thing that's tricky enough that I want to talk to someone and talk it out, if I go to Vixie or Mayrav and say I want to talk about the thing, they'll talk about the thing and then they'll help me with the thing and then they'll tell me about their latest grocery trip. If I go, Mark, I want to talk about the thing and I tell Mark about the thing, maybe he helps me with the thing, but then he wants to talk about his book. And I'm like, I don't have room in my brain for that right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. Like that, no. Yeah. No, I have to go fix my book. Can you yeah. tell me about the time you went to Ikea? <laughs> and Mark's like, Sean and I can wear. Uh, and I do, I do care about your career. I just don't I have also, room for my yeah. career and your career at the same time. I also have an unhealthy obsession with IKEA, so I would gladly tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're about, we're about to outfit an entire room in my new house with Billy Line bookshelves. Oh, Want to come over and help us assemble them? Yes, I do. Oh. I'm, I'm, here's the thing: IKEA adult Legos. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's amazing. I'm I'm really good at putting them together too. Without the instruction manual, though. Oh, I'm I'm I put together so many things no. that I know the logic of how. Yeah, but I you're you're not putting my bookshelves together without oh, no. the instruction no, 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 manual. No. <laughs> no, no, no. OCD means always knowing where all the screws go. <laughs> that was yes. a good question, though. Yes. Thank you. So anyone else? Next question. Yes, Holland. What's the weirdest bit of information you guys have come across while researching stuff? Just like food, be biology. I know you guys know. <laughs> Let me pull up my scrivener real quick. I know. I, I gotta get it. Okay. I know how to make slate wiper smallpox. I know how to make immunosuppressant smallpox. It's not very hard. I'd only need three thousand dollars in a clean. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. And I know how to. Build Let me tell you. <laughs> So I, I, just just a thing that happened accidentally when I was in nursing school. Our um, our uh, one of our instructors in in oh God, what was he teaching us? Let, let's just say organic chemistry for the time being. It doesn't matter. This guy used to work for a government agency that you know it probably doesn't even have a name anymore. Uh, his job was to figure out how to make organisms more virulent, more virulent. And he told us. It's not he, hard. He told, he, no, it's not. He told a class of nursing students how to do this. And we all sort of went, you know, 
that one instructor. Mm. And we were so tempted, so tempted <laughs> violently. Um, and this guy threw the data out because he knew, I think, at, at some level, that not one person in 50 in the class would understand what this actually meant. Unfortunately, one of the people in the class who understood what this meant was the writer. <laughs> so I'm in now possession of a terrible secret. I mean, so what is it? Let me take this a little offside. As we talk about research and, and looking into things, do you find that as if by gift, people come and tell you amazing things that are useful to you in, in your work and you have no idea why they came and told you that thing. It's like God said, look, I need Mark or Shannon to know about this thing. I will send them this rogue accountant or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. It's like God says, good, let's put the weapons in their hands. People like to have people interested in what they're interested in. I mean, we are everyone has sure. a special interest, and for a lot of us it becomes our career. And then when someone says, hey, I want to accurately write about the prevalence of live tapeworm infection following sushi consumption, can you help me? The parasitologist that you ask this of will be like, yay! I've been waiting my yeah. whole life. Also, never go out for sushi with me. It's really bad for you. <laughs> I found okay. a live Ichtherius. <laughs> we got our whole dinner pumped. Is that a victory? That sounds good. Maybe it is for you, but. I thought it was a victory. I had a pet tapeworm and I got a free dinner. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's a result. How true. That's not actually answer that question. What's uh, your strangest thing, Mark? Uh, that um, there's so many strange things. Um, I think the weirdest thing was that when I was at an, and it's interesting you brought up this specific thing where people come to you. Um, I was, you know, my book concerns surveillance and and uh, weaponization in high schools and how it's becoming a weird thing in the United States that we are allowing schools to just have weapons that should not be anywhere near children. Um, and I met at a convention a principal of a high school where the high school had mandatorily required all of the students to wear RFID badges on their person around on a necklace like a badge like this. And one student refused to wear it because they wouldn't let her put it in one of those pouches that prevents people from scanning it on the IDs that had their name, their birthday, and their social security number. So anyone could literally drive by the school and steal all their personal information. So the school oh, held God. And then Good. the Supreme Court in uh, Texas ruled that they oh, it was Texas. illegal for them to do so, which oh, is God. one of the rare things Texas does right. <laughs> Texas beef. does rattlesnakes really well. And beef. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. They have they so do. many rattlesnakes. So many. What's that? But did they get rid of the badges? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank have God. any of those students if, since if had their identities stolen? No. You go, no. You get to go back and have the badge. Yeah. Then something is very wrong. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So that was one of many strange things that you read it and you're like, this is like a science fiction, and it's not at all. No. It's very real. So, all right, someone else had their hand up for a question, right here in the green. Um, I, hi, I, I'm Lena, um, and I was curious, like, was there a point in school, like, where teachers got really annoyed at you, did you, like, did you have trouble keeping quiet or having, maybe you had behavioral issues in school? I'm, I'm just curious. Ooh. No, I was, I was the goody two-shoes perfect student, valedictorian. <laughs> who did everything perfectly right and was like, it's like super, I was one of those kids where if I got like an A minus, I would cry in class because I was like so, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, I guess. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I was, I was the, the, well, now I'm thinking about it and I'm like, I, w I was a dick. <laughs> I, was, I was a little know-it-all. Um, no, not really. Uh, not in terms of like relationship with this, with the teacher, with the other students. I mean, it, I was very easily the one who was picked on the most because I was the know-it-all kid who would get straight A's and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But um, no, I mean, no, no. I, I'm not actually kidding when I say I have OCD. I was diagnosed at nine, and it turns out that if you're someone that has OCD that manifests like mine, what you really mm -hmm. want to do at school is your homework. 
<laughs> so I did my homework, and then I did the homework of the kids sitting around me, which is the only reason they didn't beat me up more. And <laughs> then I went to the library and I read. Um, we did have an in a few incidents in kindergarten and first grade where I hadn't figured out yet that if I found new friends on the way to school, I shouldn't pick them up and bring them to school with me. <laughs> so we had a couple of snake escapes. We had a couple of frog escapes. Um, we had one... Uh, litter of opossums escape. Uh, I want you to know, you have literally not changed at all. <laughs> still, the same. still the same, which I admire. Because but I, I really didn't have yeah. behavioral... I did punch a kid once, but it's because he had been sticking a pin in my back for like three days, and I finally whipped around and slapped him, and then I was the one that got expelled. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. I meant more like sort of like, you know, you kind of stop laughing or making weird jokes. <laughs> I, no, I was terrified the other students were going to kill me. Yeah. I, like, they pushed me in front of a truck once. They shut me in a locker and peed on me. You know, I was an, I was an extremely poor kid. I was... Me too. I was not as much of a know-it-all as Mark, but that's just because I was afraid to speak. You know, so there was no room for misbehavior. Misbehavior got you killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was... I was... I grew up in a very you know, poor part of Riverside out. It's in the Inland Empire. It's about 65, 70 miles east of Los Angeles, out towards the desert. Uh, it's not a very friendly place for people who are even slightly effeminate. So it's interesting because uh, the know-it-all thing usually gets you in trouble, but mine was, it was everyone expected me to answer so that they didn't have to. So it was a thing whenever teachers prompted, like, you want discussion, everyone would look to me and be like, hurry up and answer, Mark, so we can do it. So, and then I was, I don't know, I loved learning and I loved reading and whatnot, so that was the way that I fit into that little mold, but um, but otherwise, no, I no jokes. Mm. Don't call attention to yourself. You know, if, if, if any way, I avoided it as much as possible. Yeah, like, the, the only reason I did anything ever that was misbehaving was I really couldn't figure out why the other students didn't want me to bring Northern California to the classroom. Um, I found so many friends. I had to walk a mile from my house to the school, and it was along a creek bed. And I found a road-killed opossum with 13 babies hanging off of it that weren't hurt, so I took them to school. And I found a raccoon, so I took it to, it turned out to have rabies, but I still took it to school. <laughs> And I found a ball of garter snakes, so I took them to school. And I found a couple big bullfrogs, so I took them to school. And I found a rattlesnake, so I took that to school. And, you know, I wanted friends, and the other students wouldn't be my friends. So everything that was native to Northern California got to be my friend. It's I had problems that are a slightly different era. Um, I've got to watch how I describe this because the, the language can too easily become problematic. When I was growing up in the New York suburbs, it was the beginning of a completely real estate manufactured thing called white flight, where whole neighborhoods would be stigmatized in this way by real estate agents who were looking to find a way to drive up or in some cases down the real estate values. So they would say to the overly white um, middle class populations there, um, gee, you know, the house prices in your area are dropping and God forbid, you know, like black people might move in. And sure enough, uh, this is this is a, a phenomenon specific to the like early 60s, mid 60s. Sure enough, between the time I started attending my local junior high and the time I was about to graduate as a senior, the ethnic makeup of the little town where I lived went from 80% 90% white to 95% black, 98, 99. And soon you are one of five white kids in a school completely comprised of African-Americans. And it was a unique experience in what it looks like to be a very small minority who has suddenly become fair game. Uh, and it's hard to talk about this in, in the retrospect because God knows, you know, from the white end of things, boy, we had it coming. 
you know? Um, it's hard being one of those five kids. Yeah. And to this to this day, I feel no particular guilt about the five girls from the girls' basketball team who thought it would be fun to ambush me in the stairwell. They made the mistake of ambushing me when I was at the top of the stairwell. <laughs> Gravity, can be friend. Gravity can be your friend. And I then went home having assisted gravity in its in its endeavors and was sure that for the next you know for the next five ten twenty days that i was going to be killed i would simply be killed outright on my way to school one morning that would be the end of it and mysteriously it never happened and i think it was finally a matter of embarrassment that no one wanted to suggest that the weedy little thing that weighed like 95 pounds was in any way involved with the multiple fractures they seemed to have sustained from being at the bottom of the stairwell without warning. <laughs> and you know, it sounds very strange to say this at this end of time, but I bear them no ill will because they were responding to what their parents told them was okay to do. Right. Just as all the white kids, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years before me, had been responding to what their parents told them it was okay to do. The, the karmic round was reorganizing itself in, in a way that maybe I didn't find particularly pleasant, but, but I, I do get it. I did get it. And when I went to college and never had to see any of those people again, again, it, it wasn't so much about being angry with them. It was about going, I don't have to do that anymore, anymore. Now, if they make fun of me, it'll be because they think I'm stupid. <laughs> you know, things change and they stay the same. It's peculiar, but yeah. You know. Thank you. Okay. Your characters just like kind of take you off somewhere that was totally not in your plan. And how do you like, do, do you follow them and see where the plot goes? Or do you beat them into submission so they stay where they're supposed to? Like <laughs>